Welcome, bienvenue. Au nom de la communauté de McGill, j'ai l'immense plaisir d'accueillir son Excellence le secrétaire général des Nations Unies, M. Ban Ki-moon, et son épouse, Madame Ban, à Montréal, sur notre campus. Thank you, Your Excellency and Mrs. Ban, for taking the time to join us today. Thank you as well to all of you who are here and to some of our very special guests who have joined us today. Laissez-moi vous présenter ou souligner la présence de quelques invités d'honneur. Madame Christine Saint-Pierre, ministre des Relations internationales et de la francophonie. Monsieur Denis Coderre, maire de Montréal. Monsieur Michael Grant, chargé d'affaires intérimes et représentant permanent adjoint du Canada auprès des Nations Unies. Monsieur Marc-André Blanchard, ambassadeur désigné du Canada auprès des Nations Unies. In a few moments, of course, I will pass the microphone to Your Excellency, the person you're all here to hear. Uh, let me tell you that after his address, Professor Christophe Pelk from McGill will moderate a question and answer period. C'est un honneur pour l'Université McGill d'accueillir un éminent dignitaire international. The United Nations is an important arena for crucial dialogues about subjects such as education, health, human rights, the environment, all areas of great importance to universities. Mr. Ban, as you know, grew up in wartime Korea. He has spoken about seeing the United Nations help his country during the difficult recovery process and credits that experience as one of the reasons he was drawn to a life in public service. In 2007, he became UN Secretary General. In almost a decade as Secretary General, he has been using his quiet diplomacy to tackle some of the most important global, environmental, and human rights challenges of our time. He has many achievements, which include the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. The adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The creation of UN Women, an agency that consolidates the UN's, the UN's work in gender equality and women's rights. <laughs> Mr. Ban has also made great strides toward gender equality within the UN organization itself, increasing the number of women in senior management positions by more than 40%. And the 2013 high-level dialogue on international migration and development, as well as the September summit on addressing large movements of refugees and migrants, are both testaments to his commitments to finding solution to a very pressing global challenge. His career is a profound reflection of a deep commitment to giving voice to those who are not being heard, to improving the lives of the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. He's here today to talk about threats and opportunities, the power of young people to shape a new future. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Ban Ki-moon.
Thank you. Thank you. Please take a seat. Professor Suzanne Fortier, Principal and Vice Chancellor of McGill University, uh, Professor Sestov Pels, Department of Political Science, Honorable Minister of Development and Honorable Mayor of uh, uh, Montreal, and our future Canadian Ambassador who is coming to New York, Mr. Blanchard, distinguished faculty and my dear uh, students of McGill University, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure and privilege as a Secretary General of the United Nations to share some of my thoughts and to listen to your views from the students how United Nations can work with young generation, youth leaders, to make this world a better for. I have heard um, so much about this university, McGill University, where you have produced so many leaders, not only Canadian leaders, but who have become and who have in inspired whole world's people. And it's a great uh, privilege for me. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam. Uh, Vice Chancellor, for your very kind introduction. I was thinking that because you have uh, approached it so often so much, I was uh, hoping that you would save some for me, for my <laughs> statement. I hope you still have some energy. <laughs> Thank you for your warm welcome. I have come to Montreal from New York, and tonight, Montreal Canadians are in New York, I understand, <laughs> to play the Buffalo Sabres, Sabres. I'm a diplomat. They say seasoned diplomat. So it's important to know where to say yes, where to say no, and how to say not yes or no, but deliver my message, <laughs> correct message to the people. So I, I will not take any side today, but today, in any situation, that really means including hockey games. But let me just say today, I'm going beyond my authority mandate. Go, Habs, go. <laughs> Go have school. I hope I will not have any trouble when I go back tomorrow to New York. <laughs> but I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure. Ladies and gentlemen, McGill has sent many people onto the world stage, as I have said. A former president of the United Nations General Assembly and my special advisor, on the principle of responsibility to protect, very important uh, principle to protect human rights, Ms. Jennifer Welch, human rights expert, political analyst, analyst, and many others have carried McGill's spirit uh, to the United Nations. I had the honor of meeting yesterday with one of your most prominent, uh, distinguished graduate, who should be yeah. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau? <laughs> he has recommitted Canada to the United Nations, and I'm here to re recommit the United Nations to partnership with Canada. He's <laughs> Thanks to Prime Minister Trudeau, I'm sure I can visit here more often. <laughs> he said, Canada is back. 
That is why I'm back to Canada. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for introducing my efforts to improve gender empowerment. Then people have been asking me, why do you fight for human rights and gender empowerment? I can say, because it is a 2016. <laughs> With McGill's support, I'm confident that we can boldly go where no man has gone before. That's the spirit of frontier. And that's the spirit which we need from young people. Why? What are you afraid of? There is nothing which can deter your future. You have such a legitimate and prerogative to work for your future. As another famous McGill graduate once said, beam me up, Scotty. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me be a little bit more serious now from uh, six years ago, United Nations Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld addressed the McGill International Law Association. He said, realists tempted by the illusion of cynicism and idealists are tempted by the illusion of utopia. Then, in other words, what does that mean? If you are realistic, you may expect too little. If you are idealist, you may expect too much. Then how to balance idealism and realism? I think that is the wisdom. That was the essence of some of the best advice I ever received. When I was uh, just a middle school boy, it was 1950. I don't know whether anybody was born at that time here. <laughs> My principal at that time told us, I was, it was uh, some uh, not commencement uh, entrance uh, ceremony. Uh, he told us to a young to junior, seventh grader, old seventh grader, look, keep your head above the cloud, but keep your two feet firmly on the ground. Then move step by step. How can you do that? With your head above the cloud and with your feet on the ground and move step by step. That means you have to balance between your ideals and reality, where you are faced in. That's the wisdom. And that's, you cannot be overly idealistic. You cannot be overly realistic. You have to aim high, aim high. But at the same time, just look around where you are now living in. This is my approach at the United Nations. Sometimes I have been criticized that I have been too realistic. Sometimes I have been too idealistic, too vocal, where we defend high ideals against the tough realities. That is one which I'd like to discuss with you today. At the nexus of the world's greatest hopes and worst problems, we find young people. Uh, today, I'll speak about the major threats in our world and how youth can forge solutions with the United Nations. I'll focus on four problems. First, unemployment, decent jobs for young people, climate change, armed conflict, and humanitarian crisis. These are four things which really are prevalent in this world. And four global responses to this, Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement, the Security Council Resolution on Youth, 
And this was uh, for the first time that Security Council adopted December last year. Security Council resolution on youth. They realized that youth issue can affect international peace and security. They have already realized that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that women's issue, women's right, can become a source of international peace and security issues. That's why they have adopted already 11 years ago landmark Security Council Resolution 1325. Now they have adopted Security Council Resolution 2250. So they now realized and confirmed that women's issues and youth issues can affect international peace and security. My message is that you can help turn all these ideals into actions. Distinguished faculties and dear students. The students here are part of the largest generation of youth in history. The world, we know everybody, that this world has a four billion year old history. Four billion years old. But the half of this population, global population, they are on the age of 25, like yourselves. So more than 50% of this total world is on the age of 25. That means this world is very young, very young. Many of you may be preparing to look for a job over the next decades, in 10 years. The world leaders will have to create 800 million new jobs for all new workers, including yourselves. Even in some of the wealthiest countries like Canada, nearly half of all young adults are unemployed. Climate change represents an intergenerational injustice. The older generation has not taken care of the planet that young people inherit. Now, you will be continuously be affected and influenced by this lack of what our generation and our previous generations have neglected. The world is also ripped apart by conflict. Some 600 million people, young people, live in countries that are fragile or war-torn. There are now 60 million refugees or internally displaced people. This is the largest ever number of people since the end of Second World War. We have never seen so many people. United Nations has to provide urgent, life-saving humanitarian assistance these two refugees and migrants. There are 55 more people, million more people who need, altogether, 125 million people. They need daily assistance, life-saving assistance. Do you know how many people, how big a country would be if we assemble all these 125 million people? They're all scattered. They're not much seen. If we bring them all together in Canada, then this will be a country of 11th largest country in the world, only next to Japan. It's a huge challenge which we have. Now, thousands of people are dying every day, searching for what everyone deserves, safety, opportunity, and peace. Yesterday, I visited some of the Syrian refugees who are accommodated very generously by Canadian uh, people and government. By chance, I met a man whom I had met in refugee camp in Jordan, a Jatari camp. He told me that we met in Jatari camp uh, several years ago. So he's been traveling and coming all the time, all the way to Canada. Thanks to Canada, 
he is here, full of appreciation for this country and its warm people. When I go to refugee camps, I meet uh, so many young people, just uh, in, from infant to some teenagers. What I'm worried about them is not because of all these uh, daily sufferings, uh, daily difficulty. What I'm concerned for their future is that if they would think that their future is only within this limited com compound, refugee, refugee camp, however wider this refugee camp may be, the world is much, much wider. If uh, their vision is uh, just blocked inside refugee camp, that is more terrible. That's a more difficult, quite painful for these people. Ladies and gentlemen, youth are targeted by violent extremists and sometimes blamed by, by their actions. We see sensational headlines about young killers or young women who join terrorist movements. We have seen so many foreign terrorist fighters, FTF, joining from some rich countries even, many European countries. This is, but there are some completely distorted pictures about them. They fail to show that the vast majority of young people really work very hard and want peace and justice. And they are very good citizens, but there are just a few, few hundred young people uh, who just are blamed as if they are all of your generation. I stand with you. I stand with all what you are believing in. With all these global threats, we cannot just worry about young people or work for them. We have to invest in youth. Just worrying for them is not a solution. We have to invest in youth and work with them, work for them. When I was elected for the second term, one of my five top priorities which I presented to the member state is that I will continue to work for women and young people, and I will continue to work with women and with young people. That was my, one of my five top priorities. We have to put young people in influential positions, decision-making positions. We have to put women in decision-making positions, whether in government, whether in business. This is very important. The Forbes magazine one day released their report saying that among Fortune 500, among Fortune 500, where, wherever company, there are more women sitting on the boardroom. Those companies were gaining much, much more profit than other companies. That's a proven fact. Therefore, we have to fully utilize, use potential of women and young people. That is why I have appointed for the first time in the history of the United Nations, Youth Envoy of the United Nations. I think he is here, Ahmed Alhendawi. Why don't you give him? He is a little older than you are. He's a very young. I appointed him three years ago when he was 28 years old. We don't have 28 year old special envoy in the United Nations. He is the first ever such a young special envoy. So I just wanted to empower as a symbol of a youth force, youth strength. He's connecting the United Nations with the young people and reaching out all these youth organizations. This is also essential for our 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. World leaders adopted it last September to end 
tyranny of poverty. The 17, 17 sustainable development goals, where I'm wearing this together with the city of Montreal here, they are promise for all the people. That's the vision and commitment, especially young people who can hold their governments accountable for those promises and help achieve them. Last week, 800 young people participated in the United Nations Economic and Social Council Youth Forum and discussed how youth can carry out the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. My special envoy, he will also convene a global youth partnership for the SDGs with the Youth Gateway to engage more young people in realizing these goals. And just 10 days ago, the United Nations launched the global initiative on decent jobs. This is an exciting plan to promote green jobs for young people, create quality apprenticeships, expand digital skills, and build tech hubs. Youth have been leading on climate action too, which is essential to, for sustainable development. I'm impressed by more than 5,000 young people who adopted Youth Manifesto ahead of the Paris Climate Talks last December. You can all be part of the transition to a low carbon economy, a low carbon future. You are consumers, innovators, and at the same time, you have votes. You can invest in green solutions, invest, invent new technologies, and elect leaders who are committed to climate action. When you vote next time, you have to make sure that you elect those leaders, those mayors, governors, and prime minister and parliamentarians that who are committed to your own future. Raise your voice. Tell them that challenge your prime minister, challenge your minister, mayors and governors, parliamentarians. Look, this is the world where I'm going to live. This is the world where my brothers, sisters, and children will live. So make sure that this world is sustainable. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot stop to celebrate global agreements because we are still confronting global threats. It's just the beginning. Last year, we adopted this climate agreement and sustainable development. It's just the beginning. This is year one, year one. The war in Syria has dragged into its sixth year with unbearable suffering and mass killing. Terrorist groups are committing atrocities, especially against women and girls. They must be stopped. Many people worry about the pool of violent extremism on youth. I would turn this equation around and say that youth can end the pool of violent extremism. That is why I have been calling for empowering young peace builders. The Security Council answered this call, as I said, by adopting Resolution 2250. This is a landmark resolution number. I hope you will Remember this one. This was a major th breakthrough for how we make peace at the United Nations. Until now, young people were generally seen as good enough for, to fight wars, but not to negotiate wars. Now you have to engage yourself in peace facilitating, peace mediation, and peacemaking. Resolution 2250 is our commitment to address this injustice and give young people the voice they deserve. I have also recently presented a new UN plan of action to prevent violent extremism that recommends partnership 
with the youth. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations is now coping with unprecedented needs for relief aid. The world is setting shameful records. Ten years ago, the United Nations needed only $3.5 billion to provide humanitarian assistance to these people. This time, we need at least $20 billion a year just to provide life-saving, urgent humanitarian assistance, water, sanitation, education, food. That's the minimum of the minimums which we need $20 billion to provide all these 60 million and 125 million people. We have the highest ever appeals and the biggest ever shortfalls. This is quite uh, shameful. To address these enormous challenges, we are going to convene again, first ever in the history of the United Nations World Humanitarian Summit in May in Istanbul. This will be a major chance to demand results and chart a course to realize them, to provide good future, better future for those young people who otherwise would have a miserable, miserable a day, a daily lives. I have just presented to the United Nations General Assembly an agenda for humanity. An agenda for humanity, shared responsibilities. Not a, not a single country, any country or any organization, however resourceful, however powerful one country may be, cannot do it alone. Can, Canada can do it. Can United States can do it? The most legitimate, biggest United Nations organization, we cannot do it without the support and without shared responsibilities among all of us. Humanitarian action must address the concerns of young people. And we need to mobilize young people in our humanitarian response. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was your age, I went overseas for the first time. I was born in a very poor, rural, dusty uh, village. Then I, I grew up until I became senior in the high school, in a rural, rural uh, village. I was lucky enough at that time, there was an invitation from American Red Cross and inviting the world's student leaders. I was working for as a chairman of my high school's Red Cross Society. Then I was elected and selected as one of the just a few uh, students. And we went to the United States. For a country boy like that, uh, I was, it was a huge, big uh, cultural shock. Then what was more important, which was really determined my future, of a young boy, we were brought to White House and we met the President Kennedy. I was one of 112 international students at that time. And he made the inspiring uh, brief but inspiring uh, statement at that time. I, I couldn't remember all, but later I checked I checked with the White House uh, Presidential Library what, he's, what did he say at that time. And there was a record what uh, President Kennedy said. I'll just to try to, as a final word, I'd like to uh, say something. Even at that time, he was talking about the young people. He was talking about compassion for other people. I quote, as you know, uh, in 1962, it was a height of Cold War. So countries were divided into two, two worlds. He said, the government leaders don't always get on. But I think people do. What hopes we can have for the future, and our hopes are in all of you young people. So he realized that young people were their hope. There are no national boundaries. There is only a question of whether 
you can extend the helping hand. Whether you help someone in your country or in some foreign country, that doesn't matter. The general cause is solved. End of quote. That really inspired me. At that time, he already knew that there were a lot of humanitarian crises, a lot of people who needed support. And he was asking young people like us at the time to do. I left the White House resolved to give back to the community that had paid me. I didn't have at the time even a suit so poor that my teachers, they collected some money and some neighbors, they gave me one suit, nice suit, and I resolved to pay back for this suit for other people who would not have this suit. Each of you has your own version of my first suit. You are not here at McGill University just for yourselves. You are given highest learning just to become a global citizen, have a global vision. Please remember, you are not just a Canadian or American or whichever country you may be from. You are part of this small world. You are a global citizen. When you have a global vision and work for others, then only at the time we can be a proud global citizen of this world. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, let us work together with the United Nations, with your communities, to make this world a better form where nobody will be left behind. I thank you for your strong commitment and engagement. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please take a seat. Your Excellency, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for that most inspiring speech. And I don't just mean the part about the Habs. Uh, my name is Christoph Pelk. I'm a professor in the political science department. And what we've done is that we've reached out to the McGill community and to many of the people in this room. And we've collected the questions that you most want to ask the Secretary General. And so it's been my task and my privilege to take those questions and to try and convey them to you uh, as best I can. And so before we move on to the, the big geopolitical questions, I want to follow up on your address and on these issues of youth and employment and development. Uh, this generation might be unique and unprecedented in its sheer eagerness to work on international development. And the unintended effect of that has been that development has become this very competitive and specialized uh, field. And so we have stories of uh, students applying to uh, successive unpaid internships in NGOs and international organizations like the United Nations, if they're so lucky. And so I wonder what you make of this growing prestige of development work and to students who want to respond to this call and who want to contribute to development, where would you say that uh, their skills are in the greatest need? You have uh, immense uh, potentiality. Your future is wide open. Therefore, it's up to you to choose how you can contribute to this world. You should not necessarily always become a politician. You can be whatever you want. You can become artists or professors or teachers or politicians or business communities, but that's up to you. When, while you study in this university, uh, you will be given knowledge, but knowledge itself is not important. Whatever you learn today, tomorrow may not, you may not be able to uh, remember. <laughs> or sometimes it may be outdated. It may not be a use, sometimes useless information which you may be keeping. 
that what I need, what you need at this time is to learn, learn what kind of uh, frameworks or mechanisms or it's a matter of, of application, application. Whatever you learn, it can be useful for today and tomorrow. But learn how to use this into our actual life. I think that is more important. Then you can become whatever. You can come even to the United Nations. Sometimes you can become, just to think about working as a volunteer. Volunteer. I try to go to remote, very poor, very difficult areas. As a Secretary General, I travel. It's not that I always travel like uh, good, uh, beautiful places like uh, Canada. More often, I go to remote sites, refugee camps, hospitals, war-torn conflict areas, or earthquake areas. I have seen so many young people who are working as a volunteer. I think by working as a volunteer, you learn much more, much more you might be able to learn from school. So it's up to you. But I'm asking you, be bold. Have a big ideas and big dreams. And try to be, at the same time, reasonably realistic. If you set your bar too low, too realistic, as I said, that is very easy to cross over this bar. But that will not help you. If you continuously try to run, cross, over, cross over this bar, higher, higher bar, then in the end, you will achieve. So that's what I'm asking you. Do whatever you want to do, but remember that you are, you are a global, global citizen. Yeah. On to some serious questions. Uh, the single question we got the most from students concerned North Korea. And so this might not be surprising since uh, just prior to your current post, you were South Korea's foreign minister. And so you're quite uniquely well placed to address the, the question. Uh, you have planned visits to North Korea. You've had to cancel them. Recently, just so last week, North Korea tested another uh, rocket launch. Is it time to, to say that uh, the UN strategy towards North Korea has failed? Um, and what can we learn from the UN's experience with sanctions and with, well, what some might say is an exclusion from the community of states? If you are willing to stay with me many hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a more difficult uh, to provide the decent jobs to young people is really uh, agonizing, very frustrating. Not only as Secretary General, but more as one of the Korean citizens uh, who have been working uh, for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, my, my home country. Sometimes I feel ashamed, feel guilty that how come I have not been able to make any meaningful contribution to current situation. Of course, you know, I have been deeply involved in promoting mutual reconciliation and reducing reduction of tension on the Korean Peninsula. Well, unfortunately, the North Korea have tested four times nuclear weapons and launched six times using ballistic technology, ballistic missile technology, which have been banned under sanction by Security Council resolutions. It's not proper for any member state of the United Nations to defiantly go against this existing uh, sanctions imposed by the Security Council. We were very much troubled by recent fourth nuclear weapon test. And just one month after they launched, again, the rocket using ballistic 
technology that is a threat to international peace and security. Now at this time, the emotions, emotion seems to running very high between and among the parties. I sincerely hope that uh, first of all, first of all, DPRK authorities really adhere uh, to current existing international norm. That is a basic attitude, basic responsibility of any member state of the United Nations. That's number one. Uh, second, this just let emotion running high, run high, that will not be helpful. I think we should have a cool head and try to negotiate if necessary. Uh, just to first sit down within, the, there is an existing format, mechanisms, what is known as a six party talks. Six parties should sit down together how to realize denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. That's, I think, most proper, uh, proper way. I sincerely hope that the parties concerned to this should really work hard. At the same time, at this moment, member states are now working on what kind of a measure, punitive measures should be taken again by the Security Council. Security Council members are now working very hard. My message to Security Council members is that they should take action as soon as possible. It has been more than a month when something terrible, you know, going against their own Security Council resolutions, then yes, the Security Council members who should take the necessary action, comments corresponding to the level, scale of, or scale of uh, seriousness of these uh, problems. If uh, they, the longer they take, it may just give some wrong impression, wrong message uh, to North Korea that they may go, still go along with another test, another launch. So that's not the good message. So I'm sure that the member states of the Security Council are working very hard and I will continue to engage myself. And also as a Secretary General, as I have been repeatedly saying that I will do whatever required to take as in my personal capacity, in my official capacity as a Secretary General to help reduce tension and promote dialogue and reconciliation. Thank you very much. So we're running a little short on time. We have time for just one more question. Uh, and so in closing, we read the news every day and we see reports of climate change and rising food prices in the developing world and global pandemics and growing inequality and uh, crises in Syria and South Sudan and Haiti. You've been Secretary General for nine years. You're more aware than anyone of these problems. From your unique vantage point, do you think that things are getting better or, or are they getting worse? Basically, I'm an optimist. I'm always optimistic. There have been so many terrible things, really agonizing days. But as a Secretary General, I have been refraining from using the word, what is frustrations. If a Secretary General, if a Prime Minister or a President or mayor, governors, if they say that I am frustrated, then what will happen to citizens? If a professors are frustrated, not in a good mood, then what will happen to students? Therefore, it's important for me to keep up highest possible spirit, whether it is very troubling situation, I always try to be calm, and try to think about what will be the best way to go ahead. Now, on, in that spirit, I'm telling you that we are going toward the right direction. 
however many crises we have around the world, we have at, at this moment, unfortunately, at least 37, 37 countries or places where we have fires. Whether this fire is a big fire or small scale or low intensity, these are the sources of problems in this world. At the same time, why I'm more optimistic, why we are going toward the right direction? Because after so many years of negotiations and debate, world leaders finally understood and realized that they were committed that we don't have any time to lose. We don't have any time to waver. So they have taken action to present their vision aiming by 2030 to make this world better for all the people, regardless of where you are coming from, whatever distinction you may have. This is sustainable development goals. If we can realize these 17 goals, I can clearly tell you the world will be much better. First of all, we aim to eradicate abject poverty by 2030. Second, we will have 50, this planet 50-50, men and women. The Canadian government has already realized in the cabinet, but that's a cabinet that will show very good example the whole society should be and whole world should be that way. And at least we will be able to put our planet Earth onto an environmentally sustainable path. Rather than going down, we may at least be going slowly up. And by the end of this century, 2100, I hope we'll be able to firmly control this global temperature rise below two degrees. Uh, if possible, if we strive harder, 1.5 degrees. I think we have started, just started, toward the right direction. It will be your future. And I'm leaving tomorrow. And from tomorrow, I think you will be in charge. So be prepared. <laughs> be prepared. Thank you very much. On behalf of McGill University, it is my honor to thank you, Your Excellency, for discussing this important range of topics, these challenges and opportunities that reflect the world we are studying to become a part of. Thank you for your faith in the promise of our generation to follow in your footsteps. You have left us with an enduring reminder of this community's responsibility to shape the minds and the commitments of our students. We will walk away from this presentation with a newfound energy and respect for the challenges facing our global community today and the opportunities to shape the world tomorrow. This university is home to a global family of cultures and identities, an environment where these ideas can be expressed safely and respectfully. And your talk has emphasized the importance of accepting this diversity as the foundation to generate the best solutions to these pervasive issues. We thank you and Mrs. Bon for giving us your time today, but also thank you for the many years you have dedicated your lives to enhancing international cooperation and communication. We are so honored to host such an inspiring and accomplished international leader. This is an experience that will be forever ingrained in McGill's history. So thank you again.